Hello and welcome to News Click. The Narendra Modi government is likely to present its last budget. And all eyes are already on the Prime Minister and his cabinet to see what measures they might come up with in the aftermath of their loss in the state elections. To talk more about this, we have with us noted economist and author, Professor Venkatesh Atreya. Could you just first talk about what you see as the current economic situation in India right now, especially over the last uh, four years? Five yeah, years. Well, this regime is reaching the end of its tenure. And uh, <coughs> the, the international context has also changed somewhat in over these five years. And the other frame within which you have to evaluate this is in terms of what they claim that they would do and what they've actually done. Overall, if you look at the economy, uh, there's been one major problem for many analysts, which is that the government has been changing definitions, changing methods, and the credibility of numbers in the government has taken a big hit over the last one year. So even taking that into account, I guess the two major disasters of this regime in terms of economic policy are widely known. One is demonetization, which was initially drummed up as a measure to fight several things, right. black money, counterfeit currency, terrorism, and corruption. And of course, we know it has done none of these things. And on the other hand, all the money has come back to the bank. And uh, in fact, uh, the, the measures of terrorism, whichever measure you want to use, are certainly not going to show the government in a better light than it did before demonetization. As for GST, the, the, the ridiculous spectacle of making it a second freedom movement and calling the parliament and this absurdity of a certain kind, where you actually eventually, instead of one country, one tax, which is what the slogan was, you had, of course, one country, multiple tax rates, but also multiple tax rates frequently being changed right. and uh, resulting in a great deal of uncertainty. But the more important point about both these measures, demonetization and GST, is that they constituted a frontal attack on the informal sector, small and medium businesses, agriculture, and the entire informal sector, including the workers. A demonetization, for instance, set back the economy by at least, in terms of growth rates, about two percentage points, which is an estimate that Manmohan Singh had once uh, put out, and fairly close to the target. And uh, in particular, it ended in the closure of a lot of small and medium scale informal establishments. And uh, the return to their native states of workers would migrate to other states. Tamil Nadu, I witnessed this firsthand in Chennai. A lot of workers used to be milling around the neighborhood and eat on the street. They were just gone in a few days because nobody was gonna give them credit right. in that period. So, you know, I mean, I think the, the, the list of uh, losses under demonetization is very large, including 104 precious lives. For which this government has still not expressed any kind of regret. That apart, uh, the GST exercise, you know, often it's lost sight of. What is the central feature of the GST exercise? Basically to bring the small guy under the tax net and harass him in all possible ways. Because this earlier, the excise duty limit was 1.5 crores. It became 20 lakhs turnover per year for GST. Of course, now they're rejigging it and bringing it back to 1.5 crores because experience shows that this is completely absurd. But I think this is the other point. You see, what is common to GST and the overall economic policy frame of this government is the emphasis on indirect taxes. GST is an indirect tax. When international oil prices were declining, we had the government increasing excess duties all the time to maintain its revenues. Uh, the share of indirect taxes in the central government tax revenue has gone up significantly over this period. And while the government has been, you know, uh, kind of parading around growth rate numbers, which uh, change with the whims and fancies of the concerned agency putting it out, uh, in terms of the impact on people's lives, uh, I would say these last five years have been characterized by two major elements of a crisis. One is the agrarian crisis, which has intensified. This government said that once we come to office, there'll be no tears shed and no farmers will commit suicide, all the usual rhetoric. What, of course, Amit Shah has kindly told us it's only Joomla and you know to take it seriously. Uh, but the second thing is that they said they'll create, what, I don't remember, at least one crore uh, jobs a year or something yeah. like that. And the jobs are nowhere to be found. Instead, what we now have is that the data gathering agencies which put out data on employment and unemployment have basically been told to stay cold, not to put any data out in the public domain. 
And so you, do, you don't even have, after the 2011-12 National Sample Survey, you don't have any large-scale sample survey data on employment and employment. Uh, the Labor Bureau used to put out numbers. They have been told to keep quiet. And uh, after the initial attempt to refer to Pakoda making as a major source of employment, subsequently the government has realized that that is not going to sell, and so they'll just not put out employment numbers. Now, we have serious issues because the CMI has been tracking the economy, Center for Monitoring the Economy, and their reckoning is that between last November and this November, 2017 and 18, uh, you've had loss of a very significant number of jobs, about 1.1 crore, that's a huge number. So the total people in employment of any kind, self-employment, wage employment, has declined by 1.1 crore. And certainly this is not because more people are going to school or women are going to school for longer years, the usual uh, reasoning that is really dished out. There may be a very small part of that, but most of it is basically saying there are no jobs to be found, so you stop looking for them after a while. Right. What in the West would be called disguised work, you know, discouraged worker hypothesis. In India, it's more a question of substantial disguised unemployment. People have small half-acre farms, not enough work for them on the farm. They seek employment, they don't get it. So this is the kind of labor force that shows up when you drive through the countryside or the urban areas at traffic lights trying to sell you a paper, at uh, bus stands trying to sell flowers, or on the train singing to you and hoping you'd give them some money. This is, this is or, or sitting on the road and trying to, offering to shine your shoes. So you've really created this very poorly remunerated, extremely fragile, large numbers of self-employed and precariously wage employed right. sections of the population. And you, on the other side, you have actually used the law, made changes in the law, to say that those who are currently on more secure employment will eventually have to deal with fixed term employment. Right. There's a new announced policy of the government, fixed term employment for everybody. So, you know, on employment front and on the agrarian crisis, uh, we are in much deeper trouble than we were. And you see that people after, you know, these suicides which have been around for a while, have now begun to take to the streets right. to address this issue and right. to demand of the governments that they uh, do something about it. So now you'll see a spate of announcements from different state governments right. in the run-up mm -hmm. to the uh, election. And the problem with a lot of the media discussion, especially in the financial media, the discussion on the budget, is that it's so superficial. For example, two things that happened that have not found much mention at all in the previous budgets. Two major sources of direct taxation. Direct taxation is taxation of income or wealth, and therefore it is based on the capacity of the person to pay. And therefore it's a reason, more reasonable form of taxation, an indirect tax is where the poor and the rich pay the same rate of tax on any commodity they buy. So one would normally expect that a country's taxation structure would move in the direction of greater direct taxation. Mm -hmm. However, in India it has been reversed. There was a process of that happening earlier, but now in the four or five years of the Modi regime, that has reversed and the share of indirect taxes has gone up. And you know what this really implies for ordinary people, if you, you, know, the, you contrast the rise in excise duties, contrast the GST, which ultimately hasn't delivered them what they wanted because the economy has been in doldrums, and also because of the mess with the whole GST implementation. Uh, what you find is that two very important direct tax sources have been modified. One, the wealth tax has been abolished. Okay, in a country where the most recent Oxfam <laughs> numbers tell you that the top 1% of households have 61% of the wealth, you, is, you abolished wealth tax, right? Second, in the most recent 17-18 budget, or 18-19, I'm not sure, you had a measure introduced saying that all corporate entities with an annual turnover uh, below 250 crores will now be taxed at 25% instead of 30%. No, this is practically almost the entire corporate sector, I mean, most of it anyway. And a huge reduction in direct tax revenue on that account. And uh, interestingly enough, the government of India also puts out data from the Ministry of Finance Ministry's budget documents, we look at them. They have a large sample that they study, and then they give you what are called effective rates of taxation. So for example, a nominal tax rate might be 30%, and then you add the surcharge and all that, it looks like 35, 37% on paper, penal rate of taxation, some would argue. But with you bring in all the exemptions and the concessions, the effective tax rate for corporates making more than 100 crore profits or 10 crore profits a year becomes as low as 22.8% or 20% or 22%. So public sector companies pay a little bit more, but the private sector guys are pretty good at uh, you know 
using all the loopholes in the system. So effective taxation of the corporate sector profits and of high net worth individuals in this country is something of a scandal. Right. And that I think, you know, that is where it ties up with the fact that over the last five years, what you've seen generally, the government has been priding itself on the fact that it has met fiscal deficit targets. But how has it done this? It has done this, first of all, primarily by pruning government expenditure. So the expenditure of the central and the state governments and the share of GDP has been going down. Expenditure of the center itself with the share of GDP has been going down at a time when the government needed to put in more money into infrastructure and uh, revive the economy post demonetization, post GST. And at the same time, uh, whatever uh, resources are being mobilized are being increasingly mobilized through indirect taxes. Right. Now, this has an impact on demand as well because you know, ordinary people who pay higher indirect taxes are likely to buy less than they were doing earlier. So if you don't have assets and if you don't have employment, how do you live? Very simple question. You know, any household will either need income from its assets, land, other productive assets, or will derive income through productive wage labor. Right. Now, when those two avenues are in crisis, where does the stand, the typical rural household, go to survive? Right. And, you know, it's not that the urban areas are particularly better. I mean, they may be marginally better than rural areas because of infrastructure and so on, but everywhere the crisis of employment and the crisis of agriculture both of which I wouldn't say are only caused by policies of the last five years. They've been there earlier as well. But they have, in a sense, enormously increased in size. And the contrast is also with the promises that were made. Right. So this is where we are at this point in time. These are the two major challenges. And I don't see the budget being able to address them at all. I mean, and, you know, you, unless you're dreaming of a wholesale reversal of policies that have been followed for years and years, I don't see that happening.